Hi everyone, it's Jess. Welcome back to my channel. Um, for the end of June, I am back with another video where I talk about something I am once again obsessed with, and while you listen, you can watch me do something productive. Today we'll be talking about Richard Sykin, because I love poetry, and because he was one of the first people whose work really influenced me, both as a creator and a reader. Um, I recently read his book, Crush, which took me three years to read, and that was kind of an interesting way to experience reading a book, because I changed a bit every time I returned to it. So, you might enjoy it too, I will read three of my favorites from his book. Um, I have just about no experience reading poetry out loud, so bear with me. But before we start, um, just a bit of background. So, Richard Sykin, as you probably already know, is a poet. Um, the first poem I read by him was Litany in which certain things are crossed out. And I remember I read it because this blogger who liked Naruto talked about it, so then I read it. <laughs> so. Okay, um, so if you think about it, Naruto was what got me into poetry in the first place. As he would say, believe it. Anyway, I remember being enraptured by his writing from the very start, probably from his imagery and how he used language to capture the feeling of, of yearning better than anyone else I would ever read for a few years. So I will now read you litany in which certain things are crossed out. Every morning the maple leaves. Every morning another chapter where the hero shifts from one foot to the other. Every morning the same big and little words all spelling out desire, all spelling out you will be alone always and then you will die. So maybe I wanted to give you something more than a catalog of non-definitive acts, something other than the desperation. Dear so-and-so, I'm sorry I couldn't come to your party. Dear so-and-so, I'm sorry I came to your party and seduced you and left you bruised and ruined, you poor sad thing. You want a better story? Who wouldn't? A forest, then. Beautiful trees and a lady singing. Love on the water, love underwater, love, love, and so on. What a sweet lady. Sing, lady, sing. Of course, she wakes the dragon. Love always wakes the dragon and suddenly flames everywhere. I can tell already you think I'm the dragon. That would be so like me, but I'm not. I'm not the dragon. I'm not the princess either. Who am I? I'm just a writer. I write things down. I walk through your dreams and invent the future. Sure, I sink the boat of love, but that comes later. And yes, I swallow glass, but that comes later. In the part where I push you flush against the wall and every part of your body rubs against the bricks, shut up, I'm getting to it. For a while I thought it was the dragon. I guess I can tell you that now. And for a while, I thought it was the princess. Cotton candy pink, sitting there in my room, in the tower of the castle, young and beautiful and in love and waiting for you with confidence, but the princess looks into her mirror and only sees the princess, while I'm out here, slogging through the mud, breathing fire, and getting stabbed to death. Okay, so I'm the dragon. Big deal. You still get to be the hero. You get the magic gloves, a fish that talks. You get eyes like flashlights. What more do you want? I make you pancakes. I take you hunting. I talk to you as if you're really there. Are you really there, sweetheart? Do you know me? Is this microphone live? Let me do it right for once, for the record. Let me make a thing of cream and stars that becomes, you know the story, simply heaven. Inside your head, you hear a phone ringing, and when you open your eyes, only a clearing with deer in it. Hello, dear. Inside your head, the sound of glass, a car crash sound as the trucks roll over and explode in slow motion. Hello, darling. Sorry about that. Sorry about the bony elbows. Sorry we lived here. Sorry about the scene at the bottom of the stairwell and how I ruined everything by saying out it out loud. Especially that. But I should have known. You see, 
I take the parts that I remember and stitch them back together to make a creature that will do what I say or love me back. I'm not really sure why I do it. But in this version, you are not feeding yourself to a bad man against a black sky prickled with small lights. I take it back. The wooden halls likes caskets. These terms from the lower depths. I take them back. Here is the repeated image of the lover destroyed, crossed out. Clumsy hands in a dark room, crossed out. There's something underneath the floorboards, crossed out. And here's the tyrannical reconstructed. Here's the part where everyone was happy all the time and we were all forgiven, even though we didn't deserve it. Inside your head, you hear a phone ringing. And when you open your eyes, you're washing up in a stranger's bathroom, standing by the window in a yellow towel, only minutes away from the dirtiest thing you know. All the rooms of the castle except this one, says someone. And suddenly darkness, suddenly only darkness. In the living room, in the broken yard, in the back of the car as the lights go by. In the airport, bathrooms gurgle in flesh, bathed in a pharmacy of unnatural light. My hands looking weird, my face weird, my feet too far away. And the airplane. The window seat over the wing with a view of the wing and a little foil bag of peanuts. I arrived in the city and you met me at the station, smiling in a way that made me frightened. Down the alley, around the arcade, up the stairs of the building to the little room with the broken faucets, your drawings, all your things. I looked out the window and said, this doesn't look that much different from home, because it didn't. But then I noticed the black sky and all those lights. We walked through the house to the elevated train. All these buildings, all that glass, and the shiny, beautiful, mechanical wind. We were inside the train car when I started to cry. You were crying too, smiling and crying in a way that made me even more hysterical. You said I could have anything I wanted, but I just couldn't say it out loud. Actually, you said, love for you is larger than the usual romantic love. It's like a religion. It's terrifying. No one will ever want to sleep with you. Okay, if you're so great, you do it. Here's the pencil, make it work. The window is on your right, you're in your own bed. If the window is over your heart and it is painted shut, then we are breathing river water. Build me a city and call it Jerusalem. Build me another and call it Jerusalem. We've come back from Jerusalem where we found not what we sought. So do it over, give me another version. A different room, another hallway, the kitchen painted over and over, another bowl of soup. The entire history of human desire takes about 70 minutes to tell. Unfortunately, we don't have that kind of time. Forget the dragon, leave the gun on the table. This has nothing to do with happiness. Let's jump ahead to the moment of epiphany. In gold light, as the camera pans to where the action is, lakeside and backlit, and it all falls into frame, close enough to see the blue rings of my eyes as I say something ugly. I never liked that ending either. More love streaming out the wrong way, and I don't want it to be the kind that says the wrong way. But it doesn't work, these erasures, this constant refolding of the pleats. There were some nice parts, sure. All lemon drop and melon ball, laughing in silk pajamas, and the grains of sugar on the toast. Love, love, or whatever, take a number. I'm sorry, it's such a lousy story. Dear Forgiveness, You know that recently we have had our difficulties and there are many things I want to ask you. I tried that one time in high school, second lunch, and then again, years later, in the chlorinated pool. I'm still talking to you about help. I still do not have these luxuries. I've told you where I'm coming from, so put it together. We clutch our bellies and roll on the floor. When I say this, it should mean laughter, not poison. I want more applesauce. I want more seats reserved for heroes. Dear forgiveness, I saved the plate for you. Quit milling around the yard and come inside. I think after you've read a couple of Richard Sykin poems, you already know he has such a strong voice, the way he says things. How in this book, he always seems to be addressing someone, always uses the second person, um, 
how his images are kind of scattered throughout. I think all of these really contribute to his very unique voice. And I think a lot of people, similar to me, are, are really enamored by it. You know, um, here's the part where everyone was happy all the time and we were all forgiven even though we didn't deserve it. He says stuff like this all the time. What does it mean? I don't know. Um, you have to do the work to interpret it and even when you do the work, I don't... It's, it's ambiguous but in a delightful way. Um, yeah, I really love the images. I think they're so immediate. In the living room, in the broken yard, in the back of the car as the lights go by. Same thing with the airplane. My face weird, my feet too far away. When he says, my hands looking weird, my face weird, that's a way of description totally unique to him, right? It's really interesting. Okay, the next poem is Boot Theory, which is beautiful and horrible and sad. Uh, so here it is, I will read it to you. A man walks into a bar and says, take my wife, please. So you do. You take her out into the rain and you fall in love with her and she leaves you and you're desolate. You're on your back in your undershirt, a broken man on an ugly bedspread, staring at the water stains on the ceiling. And you can hear the man in the apartment above you taking off his shoes. You hear the first boot hit the floor and you're looking up. You're waiting because you thought it would follow. You thought there would be some logic, perhaps, something to pull it all together, but here we are in the weeds again. Here we are in the bowels of the thing. Your world doesn't make sense. And then the second boot falls. And then a third, a fourth, a fifth. A man walks into a bar and says, take my wife, please. But you take him instead. You take him home and you make him a cheese sandwich and you try to get his shoes off, but he kicks you and he keeps kicking you. You swallow a bottle of sleeping pills, but they don't work. Boots continue to fall to the floor in the apartment above you. You go to work the next day pretending nothing happened. Your coworkers ask. Something that Saiken has changed about my own writing is in his use of repetition. He makes you really aware of it. Um, and you know, once you become aware of something, you can start to use it in your own writing. So to your own discretion. I think like every, every poet will use repetition at one point, but since he was one of the first poets I ever read, um, him particularly, I think it had a very large impact on me. So, you know, I think for poetry, especially when you read it out loud, repetition has a lot of power. A man walks into a bar and says, take my wife, please make it a double. When things repeat, you pay attention. When things suddenly stop repeating, you pay attention. So some part of you is realizing that something's changed each time. Um, I don't know, that feeling it creates inside you is real interesting. Anyway, I love this poem. The third poem is Meanwhile. Um, I want to talk a bit about the imagery in this one, but let's read it first. Driving, dogs barking, how you get used to it, how you make the new street yours. Trees outside the window and a big band sound that makes you feel like everything's okay. A feeling that lasts for one song, maybe. The parentheses all clicking shut behind you. The way we move through time and space, or only time. The way it's night for many miles, and then suddenly it's not. It's breakfast and you're standing in the shower for over an hour, holding the bar of soap up to the light. I will keep watch. I will water the yard, not the tie and go to work unknot the tie and go to sleep. I sleep. I dream. I make up things that I would never say. I say them very quietly. The trees and the wind, the street lights on, the click and flash of cigarettes being smoked on the lawn, and just a little kiss before we say goodnight. It spins like a wheel inside you. Green yellow, green blue, green beautiful green. It's simple. It isn't over. It's just begun. It's green. It's still green. Okay, so we talked earlier about how Saiken has a really distinct kind of voice, um, his sentence structure as well, how they relate to each other. Um, I'm a beginner writer, so a lot of the time when I write, I feel like the sentence is being controlled by how it starts rather than the feeling I'm trying to capture. 
Uh, I think that's a sentiment a lot of writers share, especially beginners, kind of being driven by the concept instead of the image, how the sentence is constructed. Um, but interestingly, I think Saiken still has clarity and coherence. Um, like, especially how sometimes words are like the, the very enemy that you are struggling with when you're writing poetry, how that kind of comes out in his work. Um, I know I'm not being particularly coherent here, but he's not breaking that many rules here, but it still feels intimate and painful um, and that it's still breaking a lot of rules, even though like grammatically speaking, he isn't. Anyway, that's pretty much it. Um, cleaned a bunch of things. We talked about poetry. Um, but yeah, today we talked about Richard Sykin's voice, repetition and image, very cool things. Um, I hope you enjoyed listening, and that you might go and read poetry of your own. It doesn't have to be his. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. This was kind of an experimental video, so I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please leave a like, a comment, and click the subscribe button. And have a good night. They'll find you in the glen. The horsemen closing.